I normally, you know, like they'll watch maybe on our website too. They might not join the Zoom. Some people are kind of odd about that. No so um, if you want to come on back in with your camera and then I'll we'll start. So thanks everyone for joining. And we're delighted to welcome Dr. Jack Chen uh, to tonight's talk, which is, oh, sorry, I forgot. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> See, that's what happens. Um, so I first met Dr. Chen years ago. I came across his essay in the New York Irish book, which was edited by Bayer and Timothy Marr. And then um, I attended a talk he gave at the New York Historical Society. But he is the director of the Clement A. Price Institute on Ethnicity, Culture and the Modern Experience. And he's a professor at the Federated Department of History in Rutgers, Newark. He is also a co-founder of the Museum of the Chinese in America and has written extensively and curated several exhibitions for various um, institutions. So we're very lucky and delighted to have him here tonight. Uh, this talk, of course, is part of our The Irish And series. And so this being uh, Asian American and Pacific Islanders Month, we're delighted to have this opportunity to talk about how the Irish and the Chinese in this case interacted. Um, like most things, Jack, it was a complicated relationship, I suppose. So there's nothing too simplistic about this. You know, there's moments of cooperation and, and moments of um, conflict. But um, I'm going to, I'll run the, the PowerPoint and um, you let me know when you want me to move things on. And thank you very much for joining. So those of you sorry, who are online, don't forget to type a question into the Q&A. Okay, let me just... Uh... Adjust this for one second and we'll be good. Um, hang on. Okay, well, um, Elizabeth, thank you for inviting me. I'm, I'm happy to revisit what had been my um, PhD dissertation, but I was an older student after I had started what was at, the, at first in 1979, 1980 called the New York Chinatown History Project. It eventually, going, going through many decades, became the Museum of Chinese in America, which is how we're known now. Um, and revisiting material uh, from your PhD dissertation is uh, both a good experience, but also a tricky one, <laughs> because um, it, it's always a question of whether these ideas hold up at, over time. And um, fortunately for me, maybe because I'm just oblivious, I feel many of the key arguments do hold up. But at the same time, there's been so much research that's been done since this book came out. And also the internet um, has become so widely available and search aids have become so much easier that I think it's easier if you have now the proper kinds of finding aids online, you can find many examples of Chinese and Irish relations of different kinds. And you'll see that this was all done before uh, the internet. Uh, so it required going to actual archives, okay, <laughs> and actually going through different boxes and looking for things. So in, in effect, I had to kind of create my own collection to be able to write about this story. Um, so what we're talking about today in this revisiting is Chinese and Irish types. And by types, I mean stage types, stereotypes, which oftentimes have to do with stereo cards, um, but also uh, print types. In other words, the way in which culture was conveyed which through the printed media, through printed uh, photographs, and how culture was really um, generated in, in that kind of context. Reconstructed is really in part about during the era of reconstruction, uh, the question of how Irish and Chinese were represented in relationship to the formation of whiteness and white supremacy and also blackness and anti-blackness. So we're talking about a complex relationship, set of relationships here. In this case, I'm talking about the triangulation of relationships between the white Anglo-Saxon Protestant imaginary and how, uh, how others were represented within that imaginary, in particular, how Chinese were represented and how Irish were represented. So it's not just a matter of what did the Irish truly be, were, were they truly like, or the Chinese were truly like, but it's also this complicated um, way in which uh, different peoples and different communities were represented. Um, so here we have uh, Thomas Nast, uh, who, 
did a lot of, as many of you may know, a lot of, um, a lot of the illustrations for Harper's Weekly. And this is one of his many representations of Dennis Kearney when he was actually put in jail after he had been arrested for. Um, I don't Sorry. think I have the same slide. The first one is ships. Uh, you have the same one? Uh, well, it's ships. Uh huh. And then there's Dennis Kearney. Well, there's somebody in a bowler hat with the American flags. I don't know if that's meant to be Kearney, though. Yeah. Um, hmm. I, I don't, I'm not sure I've seen that one, but yeah. So this is uh, this is Kearney, and and in the background. Um, you know, you have his defense of workmen, the working men's party, workmen are not loafers and loafers are not working men, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, I'm not gonna go into great depth about this, but of course he, he was one of the leaders in the Sandlot rallies in San Francisco in which he was leading very fiery um, agitation against Chinese as if Chinese were the source of all problems of uh, the economy and of the white working men, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I think there's gonna be a lot of echoes we're gonna have of what's going on today in terms of anti-Chinese-ness that's emerging as a new kind of Cold War. And um, that's a discussion I'm happy to have as after we finish the slideshow. So I'm gonna go through these fairly quickly, but this is an image of Wang Chen Fu, who was actually a journalist and later on an actor in Los Angeles. He was in some of the early, um, early films that came out of uh, Los Angeles, but, um, oops. But uh, he, in his New York days, was a journalist, and he actually started the, uh, some newspapers. Uh, one paper, which is, we believe, the first usage of the term Chinese American, uh, was a paper that he had founded. And he also challenged Dennis Kearney uh, to a duel. It was kind of uh, satirical. He was really kind of a prankster. Uh, but he knew how to speak English very well and write in English very well. And he actually was uh, printed in the New York City press a great deal. And to some degree, there is this New York versus San Francisco thing um, and more tolerant New Yorkers versus uh, the um, intolerant Irishmen from San Francisco. There was some of that kind of play going on back and forth between them. So this was a national kind of uh, debate that was reprinted in many local newspapers. Uh, um, Jack, if you don't mind, I think my slides are not lining up with yours. If you want to share your screen, it might be better. I only have about eight slides and I, I don't think they're the same. Oh, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let me start over again. Let me get, let me. Uh, so I know yours would be in President interview, but that's okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Let me switch and I'll just quickly go over them again and we can yeah. talk about that. Okay. Um, Okay, um, Elizabeth, tell me if this is working, okay? Yeah. Um, okay, so yeah, you're on the T set, but... Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Perfect. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay, this is a title I was talking about in terms of types and reconstruction. Yeah, and we had that relation. one. Yeah, mm -hmm. okay. And then this is Dennis Carney. Yeah, we didn't have that. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so this is Dennis Carney uh, as represented by Thomas Nast. And he was really speaking on behalf of the working men's uh, working men's party uh, and the organization he created. And this is the, he was giving talks in the Sandlots against Chinese, uh, and really was responsible to a large degree with a lot of the mass movement against Chinese in San Francisco, especially. This is um, the journalist, later actor, um, kind of prankster uh, who knew how to work the the Western largely dominated Protestant media, uh, Wang Chen Fu. And he started in New York giving talks as if he was a missionary from China trying to convert uh, Christians and Protestants to uh, heathen ways, okay? So he was very knowledgeable, very smart, uh, very playful with language uh, in English and challenged Dennis Kearney to a duel. Now, um, this is a poor reproduction. I was just copying images from my book really quickly for this, but it shows you the docks uh, of, the, of New York City. Um, this is really by South Street Seaport today. And it really just shows you that all around Manhattan Island, there were docks and ships. And so especially lower Manhattan was really a port culture. And we tend to think of uh, 
New York City as a, as a city of many different neighborhoods that were Irish, that were Jewish, that were Chinese. But in fact, I really believe that uh, the culture of New York City was that of a port culture in which there's an intermingling of people who are working on ships and also uh, be on passengers on ships. And they formed port culture neighborhoods in which there's a lot of intermingling going on. So this begins to kind of challenge the idea that somehow the Irish were separate from the Chinese because in fact, lower Manhattan, you had many communities, cheek to jowl, who were living amongst each other and very intermingled. So it's a really a different kind of argument. But part of what I'm making is that through the China trade and through the trade in the Atlantic world going into the Pacific world, there is a material base for a lot of these representations and a lot of these types. And the material basis for representing Chinese before there were Chinese in New York and before there was even a San Francisco was through the China trade itself. And things like porcelains, which you'll see as an example of, were traded and much desired. George Washington wanted desperately, even during the midst of the Revolutionary War, to have the latest styles of Chinese porcelain ware on his military headquarters table. Um, and the other point I want to make is that these kinds of uh, trade examples and trade relationships then also created certain images that were being played out as more and more people entered New York City and people were trying to figure out how to explain differences and um, attitudes that they brought with them uh, from wherever they came. But many of these were dominated by the Protestants. So in many ways, museums and other kinds of uh, popular forms of entertainment later on circuses played around with these representations of differences. Mm -hmm. uh, I won't go into that in detail, but you'll get the idea. This got played out in terms of certain kinds of early journals that were considered scientific journals. And in this case, a lot of you know about the practice of phrenology, which is meant to uh, measure the bumps on your, on your skull, on your head. And if you had a certain bump or an indent in a part of your, your skull that would mean certain qualities that you, uh, you had. And in the top ribbon, you'll see the five races of mankind, which is one version of the racial hierarchy. And you have in the middle, the proper Protestant high foreheaded man uh, who was intelligent, rational, and then arrayed on both sides of this superior man were the inferior races of mankind. Um, and Chinese are among them, Blacks are among them, Indigenous people are among them, Arabs are among them. Uh, and then you have women, so it's very gendered. You also have certain kinds of, um, uh, certain kinds of uh, uh, phrenological diagnoses. So on the right side, you'll see um, uh, a woman who is considered bilious, whatever that means. Um, you have, uh, you have uh, a, a man who's a little bit chubby, um, who, who is lymphatic, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So you have these judgments of personality types based on their, 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 um, their skull, but also their body shape and all that. Now, um, part of why this is important is that um, we can't just go with the material culture and the evidence about Irish or Chinese, because in fact, from a white Anglo-Saxon Protestant point of view, these stories and these um, these uh, artifacts and these documents and diaries were not important. They were not collected. So if you were to go to the New York Historical Society, for example, you could not find these materials because what was considered worth collecting were those of the white Anglo-Saxon Protestants, men especially. Um, so in some ways, this question of Chineseness or Irishness or whatever, uh, whatever ethnicity or racial uh, word you want to use to describe people was really highly constructed within a whole racial and ethnic and uh, Protestant kind of hierarchy uh, that really proliferated uh, in the Eastern colonies. And then as the US became a nation, uh, how that culture, that white Anglo-Saxon Protestant culture also proliferated uh, throughout the nation. And it's not just any Protestant culture, but it was a particular Puritan culture that was highly radical even by British standards and really kind of came into a certain kind of purity kind of notion. And again, I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail about that, but these are 
these are framings that I would add to my book if I were to do them now. So the question of eugenics, euthenics, dysgenics actually are echoes of this. And in fact, our contemporary kinds of framings of talking about going back to a certain kind of um, return to white superiority is an echoing of these kinds of same hierarchies uh, with variations. Um, let me go on. So this is an example of how the China trade also becomes imbued through these uh, Western-made forms of pottery. This is out of the, uh, the Union Porcelain Works out of Greenpoint, uh, Brooklyn. They get infused with that kind of racial view of the world that's also infused with the hierarchy of animals and how the superior white man is really dominating all of these uh, people and nature itself. Uh, again, you'll see on the sugar bowl, the finio head is an African man, a fairly well-groomed man. Uh, there's a China man in the teapot, and then the head of a goat for the milk. And then uh, on the spout of the teapot is this weird kind of uh, grotesque, which is uh, kind of part animal-like with wings that's very black with very um, exaggerated thick lips. So the, the imaginary of this culture as it was being celebrated in, let's say, 1876 with the Philadelphia Exposition was highly, highly racialized and highly, highly coded already. Um, so Irish and Chinese were brought into this in terms of the stage culture of the time. Uh, this is an example of a kind of mix up that happened in the 1870s. Uh, the, 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 the caption that I found on this piece of uh, this postcard was a man's a man for all of that. Um, and it's really representing what I suspect is a Chinese laundryman, which is a typical type that was used and there was a typical occupation of Chinese in the 1870s and 80s, especially uh, in yellow face. In other words, there's a white man dressed up in a costume and makeup that conveyed that just like black faced. And the same would be said of the woman, the Irish woman who was seen as a grotesque with extremely grotesque makeup. Um, and part of the comedy routines that would happen on stages throughout New York would be the Irish woman lusting after the Chinese laundry. So this is so common that you would see it in many aspects of the culture, the print culture especially. Um, this is from, uh, this is called Trouble Ahead. It's a show window um, that was used uh, uh, to um, to kind of uh, you know display in a in a department store window, or you could buy these little box kinds of sets that would be a kind of a mock stage, and this is replaying again this trope of the Irish washerwoman and the Chinese laundryman. These were considered these juxtapositions and mix-ups were considered high comedy and comedy relief in uh, many uh, shows. And again, you see this complex triangulation going on with Thomas Nast, who is, um, you know, uh, Protestant and very much identified with the um, kind of uh, elite culture of New York City in that way. Uh, he's interestingly uh, uses Chinese as being in, a, in an anti-Irish way. So many of you know that in 1863, there was the draft riots, and this is the background representation of the draft rioters who are in kind of classic um, ape-like um, uh, caricatured faces, which are, are signaling amongst them Irish uh, immigrants. And then you see the colored orphanage, which is being burned in the background with a, with a, a noose uh, to hang people. And Lady Liberty is really protecting this poor benighted Chinaman who's being the victim as well during that time. I'm gonna go through this pretty quickly, but you get the idea here. You have all these print versions of the Chinese and compet uh, in competition with the Irish. In this case, they're both eating Uncle Sam, and this is in some ways a representation of the transcontinental railroad being built across the nation. And then uh, they kind of, by promontory point where the Chinaman and the Irish man are face to face. And who's more voracious? Well, you know, the problem solved, the China man is eating the Irish man. Okay, so it's really silly, funny, but it's also quite impactful in terms of this triangulation of Irish and Chinese representations by the white Anglo-Saxon press. Um, so we have 
um, someone such as uh, 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 Wang Chenfu, who is in the New York press represented as very clever, uh, intelligent, and Dennis Kearney really, uh, Carney, excuse me, Dennis Carney represented as someone who is actually um, quite contemptible in the New York press. Um, so it's not a question of, oh, this is the way Chinese were, and this is Chinese Americans and Chinese American New Yorkers, and then there are Irish Americans, Irish American New Yorkers, but the representation of each Chinese, each, each group as Chinese or Irish was always situational and relational, depending on what part of the country you're in. Um, so that's it uh, for now. Um, I just wanted to kind of talk about this, but I'm happy to uh, respond to any questions and, and happy, Elizabeth, to get into a discussion with you um, mm -hmm. about um, what all this means, especially in terms of how Irish American studies are operating now. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, so there's loads, you, you've kind of introduced the topic for us. Um, can you talk a little bit, Jack, about George and or Quimbo Apo and why that story, if you can, I know you wrote about it ages ago, but why that story was important, you know, you're, you've gotten at it a little bit already that it's it's the representation and also the, you know, we didn't talk about this fear of mixing, but but that was kind of, I think, at the heart of the story too, like that, as you said, the Irish were often depicted with kind of ape-like features, a little bit lawless and clannish. So what happens when they mix with, you know, the Chinese race? And and maybe if you wanted to speak very briefly too about like how the men, because we, we didn't talk about it, but Chinese, the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1883 meant that really it, immigration was very limited for Chinese people and, and really limited to men. It was quite difficult for women to come in. So there's there's a whole thing about masculinity, you know, that affects both groups. If you want to just expand on that, yeah, yeah. Well, um, I could talk about that for a long time. Uh, <laughs> um, so um, I came upon references to this one figure by the name of Kimpo Apo, as he was represented in the New York City newspapers. Um, he was represented as a tea merchant, an exemplary Chinaman. We're mm -hmm. talking about in the, I'm trying to remember the, the early dates that I started finding these materials, um, but it was really in the 18, uh, late 1860s and the 1870s. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is still a part of a period that I would call patrician orientalism in which Americans wanted um, things from China especially mm -hmm. the elites like George Washington, but we could talk about really all Americans and we could talk about all elite Americans, all Protestant Americans. And today, if we go into a fancy hotel, we'll see that there are Chinese vases there. Well, that comes yeah. out of that kind of China trade context in which these goods were coveted and seen as a way to establish one's gentlemanly um, or uh, ladylike uh, cultivation mm -hmm. and identity. Um, so a tea merchant who is Chinese would be considered uh, kind of a, an exempted group. In other words, someone who was the elite among their culture who were mm -hmm. deserving to have our respect. And um, I can go into great detail about this, but this is all part of my New York Before Chinatown book. Yeah. Um, which um, kind of goes into this in greater detail. But someone like Kimpo Apo, who then gets together with an Irish woman uh, and there was an imbalance in which there were many more Irish women in New York than there were men, and that there are many references to Irish women and black men and Irish women and Chinese men. And when I started working in Chinatown in the 1880s, there were still um, families that come out of Chinese Irish relationships. Wow. Um, so this is not so unusual in mm -hmm. terms of the history of New York, because mm -hmm. it's, it was there in terms of legacy families that have been doing this kind of uh, intermingling. Um, and just while we're on that, like, I think it's, you just said, you know, the if you were a tea importer or, you know, since, or maybe even if you went to laundry, it, you know, these men were self-employed. They So they were possibly doing better than a lot of the Irish who would still maybe have been, you know, canal workers. I mean, we're gone from the canal, but 
that kind of blue collar level, maybe they, if they were lucky, you know, they were in the cops or the sanitation department. But it was a step up, in fact, maybe for an Irish woman to marry a, an entrepreneur, you know. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And um, this is also a time when we're talking about the 1860s, you know, many decades after the canal was completed, you still, of course, have a strong and very large Irish working class. But you also yeah. have Irish really entering into the New York City um, kind of hierarchy. Mm -hmm. So you have policemen, right? You have um, you have Harrigan and Hart, who are who become very popular on the emergent uh, New York City stage, mm -hmm. um, and then they begin to both inhabit the anti-Irish and what what white Anglo-Saxon Protestant representations and stereotypes, but they also represent other groups. Um, so in terms of gendered relationships, they will enter the they will represent the low class Irish washerwoman um, mm -hmm. and, and make fun of her uh, for the stage as comic relief, but then bring in Blacks and bring in, bring in Chinese. Mm -hmm. And those would all be represented as comic relief. So an other, a, a group that is othered and is trying to rise within the Protestant culture is then able to uh, achieve their audience, which is, becomes a mixed Protestant and Irish audience in places like the Bowery, Mm -hmm. by um, by othering other groups that are mm -hmm. quote unquote below them in terms of status and in terms of the um, the, the culture of the city itself, right? Mm -hmm. um, so just kind of quickly moving on. So the other way in which I understand Orientalism or this certain kind of othering, uh, that's not just ne necessarily negative in terms of people tend to think that the self and the other is always a relationship between the good self and the bad other. But with patrician orientalism, there was a certain kind of admiration of that, and mm -hmm. a certain kind of emulation of wanting to be cultured and achieve a certain level of um, of, of gentlemanness, of of, uh, of kind of aristocratic bearing, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and but as you as you have commercial orientalism beginning to take place, so some of the stage representations, uh, a lot of the print rep presentations by Thomas Ness, for example, but they are far worse than that I didn't show here. Uh, mm -hmm. But you can see even the Mueller um, tea set, right? Through the commercial marketplace, you start having representations that are increasingly racialized in a more negative kind of way or more complicated kind of way in which Chinese things also thingify Chinese people. Mm -hmm. So people become made into commodities themselves and we certainly understand indentured Irish laborers as being commodified mm -hmm. and of course enslaved Africans and indigenous people as being dispossessed and kind of put to the margins. But then in the commercial stage, they become thingified, blacks become thingified and Irish became thingified. Mm -hmm. But then when you get the population base of a number of Irish who are able to then support Irish theater in the case of Harrigan and Hart, that's why they're so important. They're kind of emergent in that ability to represent and write and to attract an audience that will pay. So in that commercial culture, then you get the possibility of Irish representing themselves, but mm -hmm. also Irish unothering themselves by representing other others who are beneath them, right? So that's yeah. where we get a triangulation. So it's not just Irish and Chinese, but the white Anglo-Saxon Protestant culture is always there. As kind of um, uh, as as kind of above both groups, and yeah. then how can the Irish begin to uh, you know kind of uplift themselves? Well, in part, it's by being anti-black and anti-Chinese, right? So, yeah. uh, without being too simplistic, that's what commercial Orientalism is about. But it's always in relationship to Irish representations by the white Anglo-Saxon Protestant culture and how Irish are representing themselves as they're emerging in the commercial culture itself, right? Mm -hmm. Then the, so so Kimpo Apo is living through that period. Mm -hmm. He's subject to that, and he's being represented increasingly as, um, as as a figure um, that is in some ways uh, a, a bit of a joke, um, kind of like the way the staged Chinese laundryman is, and mm -hmm. his wife is also being represented in a stereotypical way of being um, living in a in a building in what we now think of as Chinatown, which is really an intermingled neighborhood. So it's never all Chinese. There are Irish living there and other groups living there. But the, but, uh, but the Irish, uh, Irish women in that building 
are represented as all drunkards, as yeah. all drunk all the time, and that there's a lot of violence represented with that group. In a similar way that Blacks have been represented in terms of low class, no, no education, <coughs> um, either, either drugged out or drunken, and having taking no Protestant work ethic responsibility, right? Yeah. So you have you have Kimpo Apo being represented from this um, this kind of gentleman uh, tea tea merchant to becoming increasingly uh, seen through the lens of the popular culture, the commercial culture, where people are buying that kind of image because they're part of being part of a theater audience or being part of a newspaper audience that's looking at these images and representations that become the kind of popular culture of the city itself. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, and then the third form of Orientalism that Apo lived through was really what I call political Orientalism in which the reconstruction uh, and radical reconstruction and then the reaction to reconstruction happens the draft mm -hmm. riots and the Irish participation in the draft riots is in some ways a key aspect of how this political Orientalism plays itself out in a place like New York City, mm -hmm. uh, but also San Francisco. And then how increasingly then uh, not just the politicians' politics, but the politics on the street and the ability to vote for Irish um, uh, representation representatives and Irish mayors and Irish you know city council members mm -hmm. um, and having that kind of political force uh, political constituency of voters um, being able to um, basically push for the exclusion of Chinese mm -hmm. now the exclusion of Chinese which was in 1882 and then it got renewed and extended effectively until 1965. So we can talk about that. Technically, it was repealed until 43, but we're talking about a very long period of time mm -hmm. that Chinese were not allowed to come in, but it was Chinese workers who were not allowed to come in. Yeah. Chinese merchants, Chinese students, and Chinese scholars were allowed to come in. Those were the exempted categories. So then. So you were getting Apo, the elite coming in, you know, technically, yeah. Exactly. So Apo mm -hmm. represented earlier as a patrician oriental, as a mm -hmm. respected respectable, well-spoken uh, tea merchant would have been allowed in. And he mm -hmm. was allowed in, okay? Mm -hmm. he, he, I mean, this is before the exclusion laws, mm -hmm. but he was seen as the good Chinaman. Mm -hmm. The same man by the time of 1882, 1890s, and then he was the, already the father of, of uh, George Washington Apo. Mm -hmm. um, he was already being represented as the devil man, the devil yeah. man, right? Who was just- so he was living in, I suppose, very much working class accommodation down there in what was Five Points, you know, what's now Chinatown. Yeah. Um, so that maybe speaks to whether or not, you know, as a mixed race couple, were they able to rent someplace better, you know, like, or maybe it was just close to the business and it was convenient, you know. So, but he kills his landlady, was it, or a neighbor? Yeah. And I, I, am I right in thinking, and you can tell the story, that I think there were two trials, like almost or maybe like initially everyone agreed like that the landlady, as you said, you know, all these women are drinking. They're barely, um, you know, kind of civilized. You know, they're just gossipy old Irish women. So his first trial, actually, like the woman is blamed. And then by the time it comes to a retrial, as you said, he's the devil. And, you know, this poor woman was a victim. And so he, he goes to prison, but then he's found insane or he, he doesn't he go to a lunatic asylum in the end? Yeah, yeah, no, he later on in life, he's really has um, paranoid uh, yeah. and begins to fear that the Fenian army is going to come yeah. down the Hudson River and basically, uh, you know, capture him and attack him, right? Yeah. So we're talking about very complex human dimensions, which we don't have enough documents. Yeah, to know. To understand like did prison turn him crazy or, you know, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, but also the shift from uh, in the legal system, yeah. in the court system, in which he at a certain point had some friends that he was able to call upon to help him, a lawyer mm -hmm. represent him, how um, the Irish, the anti-Irish uh, female stereotype which was mm -hmm. also still very dominant in the Protestant world, uh, could be deployed mm -hmm. and how that could have an effect in one trial, but then other kinds of representations can be coming into effect in another. We're talking about 
a way in which these different forms of Orientalism actually converge yeah. and actually have a legal impact, not yeah. just in terms of his fate, but also in terms of Chinese exclusion itself. Yeah, well, and that's the interesting thing, like that uh, around this time, you've got Kearney in San Francisco, you've got, as you mentioned, like the railroad workers that, you know, we talked before we came online, there were terrible um, raids on like Chinese um, miners in Oregon and places like that, you know, where they burned villages and, and people were killed. Um, so there's huge rhetoric coming, it seems to me, from the West Coast where like maybe the, the Chinese were more numerous over there. They had been in New York for quite a bit before exclusion, but they were a tiny minority. And as you said, they were all the kind of, what looks like the upper classes, they're entrepreneurs, whereas in, it looks like in the West, they're all kind of workers. Um, and then you've got what happens to Kimbo. There is another kind of high profile murder case where that girl, she was uh, General Siegel's daughter, I think, um, he had been a famous German-American Civil War general. His daughter was kind of a do-gooder who would go down and teach English, kind of a Protestant, I think, you know, evangelical girl giving English lessons to Chinese men. And she was found chopped up in a trunk. Yeah. And again, I'm not sure if a Chinese man did do it or well, what was horrific was that the because he was a Chinese man, technically, you know, they went out and just pulled in every Chinese man they could find. So it was very difficult to get who her murderer actually was. And yeah. so that there was huge police intimidation around that case. And then in the middle of all this, as I say, Kimbo Apple. So- um, uh, Yeah, no, by the way, that was a book by Mary Louie, who's now at Yale. And she, she, yeah, was, that was a great book, yeah. She found this material at the New York Chinatown History Project when she was working with us. And oh. after she graduated from, as an undergraduate, she uh, worked with us for a number of years and mm -hmm. found this material and that became the basis of her pursuits in graduate school. So yeah. it's really an example of how archives don't always exist in the mainstream yeah. institutions. We had to create an, an organization to begin collecting this material in one yeah. place that then new scholarship could emerge which offered a different point of view. Yeah. Um, so that's part of this complicated story in which um, history is not just history. History is a constructed process mm -hmm. in which those who have a lot of power, um, those who can construct and, and control the uh, discourse or control the dialogues, those who control the archives and what facts matter and what facts mm -hmm. don't matter, mm -hmm. and therefore also what who we should feel for and identify with or who we should feel against or mm -hmm. unfeel against, mm -hmm. right? So all of those complex dynamics are part of the construction of history itself. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. And um, just on that, Jack, actually, you know, I remember when I was studying, you know, and, and reading, of course, you always fall down these little rabbit holes that you shouldn't be going into at all that have nothing to do with your own research. But, you know, because there had been all of these Irish gangs, for instance, in the 50s and 60s, and then, you know, five points becomes... Chinatown and Little Italy and all these, there were some Chinese um, gangs, you know, that, that kind of worked with or sometimes against the Irish gangs. But when does, or, or is this might not be a fair question, but Chinatown starts to become very, um, we'll say insular, but it may be isolated is what I mean too. So I'm sure like the coverage in Chinese newspapers of those cases would have been very different from how it was covered in the New York Times, you know. Um, but but that it was maybe a kind of a closed because who you know how many scholars can read Chinese you know and so there would be a whole array of sources not available to the majority we'll say of American students unless they were able to read Chinese. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So I would just argue that um, instead of thinking of the five points existing and then China yeah being taken over. <laughs> yeah, to me, the argument about the port culture is the key thing and that's right. been acknowledged. In other words, it's been always, we've always been emphasizing these separate discrete ethnicities. Yeah. So really what I'm saying in this kind of re reinterpretation that, well, yeah, that's true, right? That's true mm -hmm. because of language and customs and cultures and things like that. But in the context of New York, it begins to change very dramatically. And mm -hmm. in fact, to say that it was Chinatown or to say that Five Points was somehow all Irish, or mm -hmm. to say that the Jewish Lower East Side was all Jews, is mm -hmm. just not true. Not if true. You look at yeah. The actual census records—it's never true entirely. Yeah. 
Now, of course, when you have large numbers, it becomes a little more true, but there's always a much more complicated mixing of different groups and they're learning from each other and they're actually intermixing with each other. Yeah. But the way the dominant culture represents this intermixing is automatically saying, this is dangerous. We can't yeah. have Irish women and Chinese men getting together. That's dangerous. And it becomes very clear during the period of eugenics where it becomes argued as there, these are ways in which if you intermingle with these groups, then you, then the, the proud Protestant um, high foreheaded man gets degraded down to the level of the Irish washerwoman. So mm -hmm. that there's racial degeneration going on with mm -hmm. racial intermingling. So that theory of intermingling and mixing becomes antithetical to the dominant culture, especially powerful at different cycles of time. Mm -hmm. We're going back to one of those cycles of time in which that kind of purity and purification is really increasingly being driven. And uh, it's really dangerous for us not to know how this earlier history has operated at different points in time. Mm -hmm. And these claims of white male superiority, which did not include Catholics, did not include Jews, but yeah. now somehow those groups, if they don't act too Catholic or too Jewish, can be included in what makes America great. So yeah. I just want to make that point because it's really, we're really in a, entering into a dangerous period right now again. Yeah. yeah, and so to talk about that a little bit, I mean, it is incredible to me, maybe, you know, I'm blissfully ignorant, but we have seen, you know, really since the pandemic and, you know, other events that this, particularly in New York, you know, you always think New York is more kind of liberal and accepting and we've always been a melting pot and, uh, but there have been huge increases of violence against um, Asians, particularly like older Asians, you know, um, women, especially. and women, yeah down in what you call it Chinatown you know so I'm sure it's not you know kept to just there but um uh, you know why do you think it is just rhetoric associated with the pandemic and you know the the rise of groups on the right this kind of ethno-nationalism that we're seeing again um you know like we thought certainly that we had put this behind us you know since I now know obviously internment affected Japanese Americans more but you know, we kind of thought there had been a reckoning after the World War II internment of Japanese Americans, and, and yet here we are today, you know. Yeah, well, no, I, I'm, I'm glad you're raising it in the sensitive way you're, you're discussing it. Um, uh, another book I've worked on uh, is a collection of anti-Asian fear, mm -hmm. a collection of artifacts from, the, um, from many libraries and the visual culture and the mm -hmm. political culture of, uh, uh, of kind of really Western European Nordic culture, mm -hmm. Nordic in the way that eugenics has framed it as yeah, yeah. Protestants, you know. Um, so that book is called Yellow Peril, Exclamation Mark, an Archive mm -hmm. of Anti-Asian Fear. And um, so I was really trying to take on that question after I uh, had worked on um, that exhibit at the New York Historical Society. And there's also a documentary that, um, that Rick Burns did, Ken Burns' brother, Rick Burns, mm -hmm. uh, who did the New York City documentary series, but also um, the, uh, the documentary on Chinese exclusion. So people, mm -hmm. I want to encourage people to look at that, that documentary. Mm -hmm. And so it's really a question of how yellow peril, fear, has actually operated in a constant way that has never left the way the US culture actually operates. Mm -hmm. So it may switch Chinese to Japanese, to Korean, to Vietnamese, just to, to Filipinos, right? So historically, if we look at a lot of the wars that have existed and the Cold Wars that continue to play out, it shifts from one country where there's a good Asian to a bad Asian, but then suddenly in the case of Japanese, um, it flips so that the Japanese are no longer the good Asians and the Chinese are the bad Asians, but the Chinese suddenly are the good Asians and the Japanese are the bad Asians. Yeah. So you have that constant flipping going on um, and that's deep, that's a deep indication of kind of a, a, a fear of uh, the Asian race and those mm -hmm. who are deemed yellow, which, you know, at one time included the Near East and then became the Middle East and then became uh, South Asians were considered a yellow and then mm -hmm. Far East Asians were considered yellow. Mm -hmm. So it's always a relational dynamic as opposed to something specific about the Chinese. 
Mm -hmm. Of course, there are things specific to Chinese culture, as with any culture. But if we try to overemphasize that and underemphasize the dynamic relational histories and mm -hmm. how at one moment we can talk about weapons of mass destruction or um, Chinese stealing and espionage of, um, uh, of chip technology, uh, computer chip technology. If, if we play those, those scenarios out with a broad public through the commercial and political culture of any given time, then it's very easy to kind of manufacture that kind of consent. And before you know it, we're in a long war that has not been won. Uh, yeah. And we spent billions and billions of dollars that have really uh, disabled this nation in dealing with its own issues of poverty and housing mm -hmm. needs and all those questions. So how are these played out and how quickly can these uh, tropes or types be manipulated in a way that people who don't know the history necessarily get, get fooled into wanting to believe the government or wanting to believe the, news, the newscaster mm -hmm. and thinking that yeah, they, they must be true. And this is how we understand it uh, in mm -hmm. our everyday lives. Right? Mm -hmm. And there seem to be a lot of, um, uh, what's the word, contradictions, you know, I mean, obviously, because of the Chinese Exclusion Act, and you were saying it really wasn't repealed until 65, when we had the, the big, you know, Immigration Act that overhauled kind of quotas and all of that. Um, so I would imagine that a lot of Asian Americans are third and fourth generation. You know, they're here as long as the Irish are coming in, you know, mid and early 19th century. Um, but by the same token, you know, having taught at Fordham University, we have tons of students coming in every year to study. And so, you know, there, there is very much still a, a relationship today with the Chinese. Uh, we call it the state, you know, where America accepts students, for instance, you know, to, for a three or four year degree and then send them home. Well, that's, but, kind of, that's kind of dropped off the cliff now because oh, it has? of the attitudes mm -hmm. uh, towards Chinese students and the fear that somehow Chinese students are spies. Yeah. And so the numbers of Chinese students being able to get support or being able to get entry visas has just dropped off the cliff. Wow. And the numbers of American students studying in China, which used to be rising quicker and quicker, mm -hmm. people are thinking that they need to learn Chinese language because of mm -hmm. the growing Chinese economy, that's also dropped off the cliff. Wow. So the, the kind of emergent Cold War that we're entering into right now of the US versus China um, is, has become deeper and deeper in a way that's actually quite, quite scary. I think yeah. it's, it's, it's a competition, especially during the era of global warming. Mm -hmm. um, and the fact that we don't have that many years to really make progress, uh, mm -hmm. getting down our economies to zero carbon. Mm -hmm. And this kind of war in the name of who can be greener is the most absurd thing possible because war is part of what pollutes um, mm -hmm. the, globe the fastest. Mm -hmm. um, so we're entering into a really crazy, crazy period, which is almost kind of manic in terms of how policies are really flying in all sorts of different directions. Mm -hmm. um, just to bring it back, I see there that um, Rita asked when she came in late, were there a mixing of Irish men with Chinese women or was it just mainly Chinese men and Irish women? She says, I apologize. And I, I think you had said really women were kind of prevented from coming in particularly, you know, around the 1880s, but even before that, it may have been mostly Chinese men that came in on both coasts. Um, am I right in thinking that? Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, there were instances of Chinese families arriving mm -hmm. um, as, um, as uh, fisher folk who are having families in Monterey Bay, for example. Mm -hmm. um, but generally it was male migration and uh, the thought was that if the men did well, they would bring their women over, but then there increasingly became um, representations of the Chinese women as being uh, prostitutes, mm -hmm. uh, which later on became true in American military zones, especially, mm -hmm. you know, Vietnam, Korea, et cetera, Japan. Mm -hmm. uh, but this representation of Chinese women as having loose morals uh, quickly became a dominant stereotype that then justified the passing of laws against Chinese women from immigrating. Yeah. So that, that's, so this idea of controlling populations, controlling male populations um, through uh, not enabling them to have families, uh, yeah. but then also setting up the fear 
of Chinese race mixing of Chinese men uh, preying on innocent white women, which is another kind of popular mm -hmm. image in the uh, in the popular culture, which continues to this day. Yeah, uh, similar to black men preying on white women. Yeah, and, um, that kind of image becomes dominant. That becomes the kind of that seals the deal about saying, well, you know, these men are just dangerous. We have to keep mm -hmm. them out. Yeah, so. mm -hmm. And as you said, it was a way of attempting to limit the demography, like if, if you can't have a family, you know, yeah. But so these Irish women, um, I think I read one time, you know, there was maybe one Chinese lady for every 10 Chinese men, but then as many as one in four marriages in, in certain areas of downtown New York were between Irish women and Chinese men. And sometimes the Chinese men, you know, took her name or became Catholic, um, it, maybe not always, but it was you know, kind of, um, I suppose, mutually beneficial, you know, she married up because she was married this entrepreneur and he got maybe a chance to sort of quote unquote westernize, you know. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so go ahead, sorry. Oh yeah, no, so as I was saying in New York, it was actually quite common, that's true also in the east uh, Eastern seaboard um, with Baltimore, Boston, mm. um, you, have, you have these intermixtures that are happening. Mm -hmm. um, really, uh, separate from the anti race the racism and the anti Irish or anti German or anti you know Jewish uh, attitudes that may have existed, but mm -hmm. you have these intermixings that are happening in the port culture neighborhoods mm -hmm. because these are people who are literally living next to each other and getting to know each other, speaking each other's languages, mm -hmm. um, but you still have this kind of heavy emphasis of the dominant culture yeah. to try to control this kind of mixing that's going on. Yeah. Yeah. And so um, just to get back to Kimbo and then later on his son, George. So George, of course, is the son of an Irish woman and a Chinese father. And when his dad goes to prison, he remains in New York because the mother has left. She's gone to the West Coast with, I think, a daughter, but they drowned. And George then becomes, um, as many young men at the time did, you know, kind of, he was a pickpocket, uh, a street thief, fell in maybe with, you know, different criminals. And of course he had, you know, both sides of the Irish gangs as well as maybe the Chinese gangs. Um, but he eventually, he meets his dad again because he is put in prison in, in Sing Sing and then he meets his father for the first time in a long time. And then has this amazing sort of turnaround where he plays himself on theaters in the Tenderloin, you know, in these kind of plays about immigrant New York and, and kind of city life in, you know, in New York. Um, so he is rehabilitated, too strong a word maybe, but, you know, he ends his life well, I think, uh, after having done stints, <laughs> lost an eye in prison, yeah. Yeah, you know, it's hard to say um, what all these stories are about. I mean, I, I think, it's well worth looking at the book on uh, George Apple. So hopefully you'll have a chance to have Timothy Guilfoyle uh, join you in this discussion. Um, you know, it's these are complicated stories and we don't have sufficient archives. Uh, he's yeah. done a fantastic job uh, gleaning through a lot of the archives that are now increasingly available. He's done a mm -hmm. really great job on that. So um, it's- And I think George see. wrote, you know, an autobiography that wasn't published. Yeah. So he had that, which is amazing, yeah. you know, yeah. yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. and of course it's a later period, so that yeah. is a possible possibility. And George was literate in a way that uh, Kimpo Apo was not in mm -hmm. writing of the language and writing mm -hmm. of himself. So there are those kinds of differences, but it's also during the time in which there's a great deal of 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 um, anxiety about crime in urban areas. First of all. Mm -hmm. Uh, New York City is growing by leaps and bounds. Its population is doubling constantly, mm -hmm. and you get enormous congestion. You get enormous uh, divides between wealth, wealthy people and poor people. You get terrible housing, and desperate kinds of street situations where sanitation is terrible. Mm -hmm. um, so oftentimes those immigrant groups are blamed for the terrible conditions they're living in or the disease. We had talked earlier about disease, you know, the diseases that become uh, endemic in mm -hmm. neighborhoods become identified with those people as the reason why disease has entered in is because of those people and not because of sanitation, right? Yeah. So those kinds of questions come to dominate um, city politics. And so the criminal class and the, the role of the police and the role of vigilantes begin to increase 
And so it's hard to quite understand in these two generations of oppos. And we should mention Catherine Fitz, uh, Fitzpatrick, um, who's the who's the who's yeah. the uh, the woman. And hopefully somebody will write a book about her, right? And yeah. then and then maybe we someday we can kind of get closer to what that story of that family is all about. Was yeah. All about. Um, but. Um, uh, but uh, so it's hard to know, given how there were these Protestant crusades um, that, for example, Teddy Roosevelt had been involved in, uh, mm -hmm. you know, the kind of ascribing criminality, ascribing um, uh, doping, um, drugs, mm -hmm. alcoholism, you know, and I just want to remind people that, I mean, so I'm sure this audience is kind of aware of the anti irish stereotypes that existed in terms of drunkenness, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, in terms of opium, it was yeah. really the British who imposed opium on China. Yeah. They, were, they were the dealers that insisted on dealing opium through um, the ports and really mm -hmm. addicted to the nation and changed the balance of um, trade uh, mm -hmm. in uh, the British favor. And Americans, people like John Jacob Astor and other, many of the Boston traders, um, were um, very deeply involved in the opium trade as well. So we're talking about complex questions of what becomes criminalized and what are the limitations of opportunities. And so I just don't know entirely how to read the, this two generational yeah. story, yeah. except to yeah. raise questions that are against the dominant narrative that is too easy to create. Mm -hmm. Especially when, as you say, the majority of the sources are coming, you know, from there. Uh, so, if anyone has any questions, you know, please type them into the thing. We'll, we'll finish up in a second. Um, I thought it was very interesting what you were saying about vaudeville, Jack. Um, you, we are looking at that here. You know, we're writing an exhibition about the Irish and vaudeville, and it's it's such an interesting switch over. You know, when you initially are kind of passive and you're the butt of the joke and you know and then not only you know are you producing the content but as an audience you know what appeals to the audience is no longer like the the dumb Irish maid or you know and so we see this increasing kind of sentimentality and you know my Irish mother and, and all this kind of jazz but but also sometimes where they can poke fun nicely you know at, at themselves or or and so there are a huge amount of plays, you know, with Abe's Irish Rose, where, you know, it talks about the Irish and the Jewish mixing or or the Chinese and the Irish mixing. Um, but it's very interesting. I, I love what you said. The slogan of that card was a man's a man for all that. Like that, you know, she's happy to get anyone, you know, like implied, even if it's a Chinese man, you know, so okay. um, very, you know, very tough things to grapple with, I think, you know, for... Um, them at the time but also even for us now because yeah. uh, as you say you know with this violence and kind of domestic and foreign relations jack asked was labor was the labor movement an aid to asian cult cultural inclusion you know i'd say probably not <laughs> are you an addict no yeah no it was quite the opposite um, yeah really only in more recent times i mean the iww had actually been very inclusive um so yeah. That would be the exception uh, historically, but it's really only now that you have uh, uh, Latino um, Latina men and women, and also Asian men and women from many different places who are really constituting the labor movement today. Yeah, and that could have actually happened before, but um, the white um, kind of elite laborers, uh, especially yeah. the Favelle. Uh, Samuel Gompers were amongst the, the leaders of the anti-Chinese movement, just mm -hmm. as Dennis Carney was a, a leader of the anti-Chinese uh, movement on behalf of white uh, working men. Yeah. So in fact, I mean, it is an example of how an Irish person, an Irish male laborer in San Francisco, farther away from the Protestant stranglehold over the, the dominant culture, can become white in effect, yeah. can more white, and especially in relationship to being anti-Chinese or anti-Black. So yeah. we have these triangular dynamics that are not just about the Irish people. I'm not really commenting about Irishness or Irish culture that somehow it's inherently corrupt. You know, I'm yeah. not saying that yeah, whatsoever. No, I'm <laughs> <laughs> um, but, um, 
but it's really but it's uh, fitting in with the system yeah yeah, yeah. so exactly. for irish war upwardly mobile quicker on the west coast because you know it was a free-for-all whereas as you say here they were curtailed a lot longer because of the catholicism was against them um so dennis carney yeah and the working party working men's party uh, to answer Jack's question, absolutely. Like I know, you know, the Irish involved in the Knights of Labour and stuff were not inclusive of people of colour, women even sometimes, although Mother Jones, of course, was, you know, a huge powerhouse. But yeah, it, it looks like, you know, and it's so interesting because, of course, it must get very complicated then in the 20th century with, you know, socialism. And, you know, so while there's labour unions here trying to steer around you know like the philosophy of, of socialism and stuff and yet um we have the mccarthy era hearings you know that must have been very tricky for chinese americans to navigate um if they were trying to get involved in a union yeah i mean I, I guess i would say that um i mean there's a few points that need to be made about that um during the the um, spanish civil war in which mm. you had um premature, quote unquote, premature anti-fascists from, uh, from the United States going to fight uh, on behalf of the, of the Spanish people against fascism, there were Chinese there. There were Chinese from China and also some Chinese Americans there. Um, mm -hmm. So you do have movements in which Chinese are involved in anti-imperialism, in anti-colonial in, in anti kinds of uh, efforts. Mm -hmm. But if it's strictly based on um, the traditions of white male labor, and, and building on those traditions, especially among the more better paid and the elite uh, labor organizers, it consistently was anti-Chinese, um, okay. and consistently anti-Black as well. Yeah. And even when it's beginning to accept Black workers, there are so few Chinese men uh, because of the exclusion laws that in some ways they were kind of pushed out of the picture, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, um, maybe, I, I mean, I know we need to wrap up. I'll just kind of maybe make this one additional connection. So since the time of the publication of this book, but also increasingly now, there are two historical frameworks that historians have been understanding. One is the emergence of the Atlantic world, which is no longer the triangular trade in the Atlantic world, you know, rum, you know, sugarcane, cotton, um, mm -hmm. you know, to England, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But it's now understood as the Atlantic world, in which the, in the Atlantic world, by the exchange of goods, people, and ideas, there's a constant contestation. There's a Black Atlantic. There's an Indigenous Atlantic in which Indigenous people are being brought to European co court cultures, and how they're being represented in Germany, for example, is really dramatically different than how it emerged in the U.S. You know, mm -hmm. so there's the Atlantic world. There's the emergence as whaling ships are going into the Pacific mm -hmm. of the Pacific world and the negotiation of these many different seaports and, and, and port cultures uh, mm -hmm. throughout those regions, right? So, so that's one dramatic change. There's an acknowledgement of what happens in these ports is a lot of mixing that's going on. Mm -hmm. um, so it's no longer the kind of racial purification of inland cultures that imagine themselves to be all British or Anglo-American. Protestants. It mm -hmm. begins to be more complex, especially on the seacoast, especially along border regions. The U.S.-Mexican border becomes one of those regions where those dangerous Catholics are seeping into this country. We have to protect our borders. You know? So all that kind of way of thinking begins to kind of get uh, more complicated. Mm -hmm. um, the, other, um, the other point I would say is that it's really with eugenics, I, I think it's really important for us to not just to think that somehow eugenics was a pseudoscience that has passed, yeah. but the relationship between eugenics, white nationalism, and in certain ways, a kind of socialism for a certain group of people, but mm -hmm. not for other people. So in some ways, we can think of national socialism as a socialism for white people. Mm -hmm. um, so we're entering into a more complicated set of questions, um, but we need to look at the eugenics period, to understand that kind of complex hierarchy of mm -hmm. uh, Jewish women uh, marrying a Protestant man, a high Protestant man, or a Jewish woman marrying a black industrial worker. Um, and, you know, all these complications of sexual class, um, ethnic, religious identification mm -hmm. as being really something that's embodied and being established during the eugenics period. Yeah. So it's not simply, oh, those Nazis, they were the eugenicists, but actually New York City 
was a yeah, was a home home, was a center mm -hmm. of the mm -hmm. eugenics movement. And um, we recently, in 2021, organized a major conference um, on eugenics. And if you go online and look under the Anti Eugenics Project, you will mm -hmm. be able to access a lot of that information and material. Yeah, it was about sexuality. It was about disabilities. It was about what's considered normative and what's mm -hmm. considered abnormative. Mm -hmm. um, so it's really a complex of all these different groups in different parts of the country being hierarchies mm -hmm. and then how those hierarchies then uh, converge in a national political culture, especially with the emergence of a national media and the railroad linkages and the new technology linkages. So in some ways now, the internet yeah, and AI are just compounding these kinds of questions because they're not resolved whatsoever. They're just going to yeah. be made worse and worse and worse. Yeah. Yeah, and I, that is important. I think, you know, the, even the passing of the great race in 1907 or 1908, you know, Madison Grant's book, where the hierarchy, you know, as you say, all of the different groups of immigrants and, and say who's desirable or not. And it's interesting to think about AI as now, you know, this kind of cutting edge technology, which may or may not, you know, there was a, an article in the New York Times, I think yesterday or this morning, saying, you know, it, it could lead to the downfall <laughs> of humans. So um, it's hard not to be worried about that, I think, you know. You know, and one of the things I've learned uh, as I've been looking at, I mean, so I've been working a lot on global warming issues and what mm. that meant historically. And the complicated relationship that Irish um, refugees had coming to the US, because what I've learned is that the British colonization of Ireland effectively meant the uh, deforestation of the oak trees, the oak forests that, you know, we think of Robin Hood or, you know, these yeah. sort of, you know, what do, the deforestation to conquer Ireland. Yeah. And, and how all that oak, wood oak paneling got into the manors, but we tend to forget that it really, to conquer the Irish people, it took the deforestation of Ireland. Mm -hmm. and then, then therefore, the kind of vulnerability to the monocrops of potatoes yeah. and all these kinds of things that then caused mm -hmm. mass migrations out there. So what happens when you're coming out of that kind of uh, fierce uh, colonial situation and you learn certain things, but you also don't learn other things mm -hmm. as an Irish immigrant and as an Irish migrant. And then you come to this country where there appears to be so many, so much bounty, mm -hmm. so many opportunities in comparison to where you just left. And then how does that put you in a position in which you may go one way or you may go another way or your family may be very conflicted about how they identify and how mm -hmm. they're treated, right? So I, I just really wanna advocate for this kind of understanding of each group that's coming over. And to, you know, no matter how they end up politically, it's important to understand mm -hmm. um, what that kind of structure of emotions and feeling and then how unfeeling uh, of um, prejudice and violence and kind of acting out and paranoia also gets uh, conveyed. Right? Yeah, absolutely. Well, that's, you know, I, I, we say that all the time here that we have more in common. You know, our 19th century story has more in common with 21st century immigrants and, and refugees than we think, you know, so we do have to be mindful of that. So, um, Dr. Chen, thank you so much for joining us tonight. I, I, this was uh, incredible. I think you've shed a lot of light and more importantly, opened questions for us. You know, it, it's nice to be left with questions and not always have the answers, but something to think about. Uh, thank you all for joining us. And I think we're not really back. I'm fin finalizing the June calendar of events. We'll certainly have um, Chloe Agnew and Brian McGrain in concert on the 15th of June. And we're hoping to do some events to mark Pride Month. So just keep an eye on our website and Facebook. But thank you, Dr. Shen, and have a great night and rest of the week. Take Bye care, everyone. everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Well. I really appreciate it. And keep an eye out for your book. I'm going to get them in the shop. <laughs> <laughs> Books. Yeah, but thank you.